Well, hello and welcome to our Bible study. Uh, we are in a new unit. This is lesson two of our study of how great is our God, passing the faith along. And we're going to be looking at big events of the Old Testament. We looked at the story of Noah last lesson and preparation for the flood, that big event, but got how you but how God used Noah in preparing him for being a faithful follower of God and being able to quote pass the faith along to future generations by allowing the faith to continue. Today's lesson is going to be on Abraham. We're going to be looking at Genesis 22, verses 1 to 18. There's a lot that we can study about Abraham and recognizing his great faith. Uh, we're going to be looking at a particular text here today with regard to uh, God's calling him to offer up Isaac as a sacrifice, and we'll look into that. The title of our lesson, of course, is The Results of Obedience. And what I'd like for you to do is there now turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 22. We're going to read the text, and then I'll go through an outline of it, and we'll walk through it section by section so as to get a, uh, an understanding of how things are going. At the end, of course, we'll discuss how this is a big event. We'll discuss what this can mean for us moving forward. But let's go ahead and read the text first. We're looking at Genesis 22, verses 1 through 18, and we're reading in this unit, at least I am, from the New American Standard Bible, the 2020 edition. Now it came about after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham. And he said, here I am. Then he said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I will tell you. So Abraham got up early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac, and he split wood for the burnt offering and set out and went to the place of which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham raised his eyes and saw the place from a distance. Then Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey, and I and the boy will go over there and we will worship and return to you. And Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and laid it on his son Isaac, and he took in his hand the fire and the knife. So the two of them walked on together. Isaac spoke to his father Abraham and said, My father? And he said, Here I am, my son. And he said, Look, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. So the two of them walked on together. Then they came to the place of which God had told him, and Abraham built the altar there and arranged the wood and bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. And Abraham reached out with his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. And Abraham reached out, excuse me, but then the angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. He said, do not reach out your hand against the boy and do not do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Then Abraham raised his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him was a ram caught in the thicket by its horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering in the place of his son. And Abraham named that place, The Lord Will Provide. As it is said to this day, On the mountain of the Lord it will be provided. Then the angel of the Lord called to Abraham and a second time from heaven and said, My, By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son, indeed I will greatly bless you and I will greatly multiply your seed as the stars of the heavens and as the sand which is on the seashore. And your seed shall possess the gate of their enemies. And in your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. Well, let's take a look at what we've just read in terms of an outline and see how this is going to play out. There are about four different sections we're going to be looking at as we go through the text, and we'll come back and look at how each of these fits into our understanding of the overall narrative. The title of our lesson, The Results of Obedience. First, we're going to look at Abraham's obedience being tested. That's verses one and two. Uh, we've read it, of course. We'll know what's going on there. But then we'll look at three more sections. We'll talk about Abraham's obedience decided, uh, chapter 22, verses 3 through 8. And then thirdly, Abraham's obedience demonstrated, verses 9 through 14. And then we'll conclude with Abraham's obedience blessed, verses 15 through 18. 
Well, let's go ahead and take a moment to go through the text and watch how God will work through what Abraham is doing and how this becomes a big event for the, uh, really not just the big event for Abraham, but a big event in the nature and history of redemption. First thing we look at is Abraham and his being tested. Uh, it's interesting the way the text begins, given where we are in the narrative of Abraham. It says, now it came to pass after these things. Well, what things? Well, going all the way back to chapter 12, we can know of God's call of Abraham originally. We know of God's promises to Abraham and Sarah that it would be through them that he would have a son and that it would be through Abraham and Sarah, the son Isaac, we would come to know him by name later, would be uh, the descendants. Through Isaac would come the descendants. And at that point, God had declared that the number of descendants would multiply such that it would exceed the number of the stars in the sky. And so we see that happening. Of course, Abraham and Sarah decide that they're going to do things their own way. And Sarah offers up Hagar. And as a result, Abraham and Hagar have a child named Ishmael. God tells them, that's not the plan. I told you I was going to promise you a son through you, your own lineage, and through Sarah. And so Sarah laughs about that. God calls her out on that. Eventually, though, in time, she does bear a child, and they name him Isaac, which means laughter. It's after all of this that's gone on that now with Isaac, probably in his teens, we don't know exactly when, uh, we know that it was a number of years between the time of God promising Abraham and Sarah the, uh, the child and a number of years after God had called Abraham to go into a land that I will show you, he says, that all of this takes place. And now we know that he's a young man. And so we see God has promised and God has fulfilled the first stage of that promise. He has a son. Interestingly enough, then, after all of that, seeming like everything's on target, everything's on, on course for what God has called him to do. God has called him to be a, a progenitor, if you will, the ancestor of a nation that would be God's messengers of redemption through the world, that he would be a blessing to the Gentiles, to, to all nations. God has made promise that this would come through Isaac, and now there's a test. Well, what more can we be through? Uh, Abraham and Sarah have uh, been at times obedient and at times disobedient whenever they've traveled. I'm not, there's no time to get into the details of that backstory, but go back and read chapters 12 through 21, and you'll see all that Abraham went through. But they've made it. They've gotten this far. There have been trials and tribulations, and now God has brought them to a point where fulfilled promises are in front of them. And now we see in these very brief words in verse 1, God tested Abraham. That's interesting. They've been through all that. And now we're told God tested Abraham. Now, that's just a summary statement. We have to read further, and we already have, so we know what that test is going to look like. But original reader would look at this and go, what now? What is happening now? Well, in view of that, what we see in the text is that God then calls out to Abraham. And I'll talk about this more as we move forward. We see a text weaving between using the term God and angel of the Lord and God, and we'll talk about that as we move forward. But it's interesting here, it's explicitly God calling out Abraham by name. Notice the response of Abraham then. He says, here I am. And what we have then is the first time in the Bible where there is a response of a call from God to someone and they respond. Uh, obviously, there are other things going on in the Bible up to this point. We don't have a lot of narrative in the Bible, though we've covered a long period of time from Genesis 1 through 22, long period of time. We see the conversation that God has with Noah. Here, God has a conversation with Abraham. And what we're told is that he calls him by name. Abraham says, here I am. No questions asked at this point, not what, what's going on. You know, he's got a relationship with God and such that when God calls him, he can say, here I am. It's language you're going to see in other parts of the Bible as well. You'll uh, note that the times when Samuel says that to Eli, uh, we, we've seen that with Isaiah, here am I, send me. There are other places in the, in the Old Testament where you see this idea of when called upon, one will say, here I am. Uh, use me. God is going to test Abraham. Now, again, we already know what's going to happen, but imagine Abraham hearing God's call. We know there's a test coming. The question might be, what is the test? And then why? Remember, we've already seen that they've been through a lot. Why the test? And what could that test be? And what would be the accomplished goal here? 
Well, what we have is Abraham's mere statement, here I am. Here I am. He's saying, I'm ready to hear what you have to say. I'm submitted to your will. I'm submitted to what you want to command me to do. Then God speaks to Abraham directly and says, take your son, your only son, the one whom you love, Isaac. Now, it's interesting because we have Isaac by name already. That was given chapters ago. And now we have God talking to Abraham about who Isaac is to him. He says, your son, and that's a given. We recognize that. But he says, your only son. Now, at that point, we can stop and go, wait a minute, we know he has Ishmael, but we have to recognize that Isaac is the son of the promise, and that's borne out not only here in the book of Genesis, but it's borne out in Paul's writings as well, the distinction between Ishmael as a son of Abraham and Isaac as a son of Abraham. This is the covenant promised son, the only son. Beyond that, then, what does God say about Isaac to Abraham? He is the one whom you love. Now, of course, it's a given. That's his son. Um, later on, we're going to see that when he describes Isaac, he doesn't use the term whom you love, but it's clear that that's indicated. He says, take your son, your only son, the one you love, Isaac. And then he tells him to go to the land of Moriah. Now, a little bit of background here. Uh, likely, as we'll see later, uh, Abraham is in Beersheba, and that was a name given when he made a covenant with Abimelech. And they burnt sacrifices and passed through them and uh, made a covenant there. And he called it Beersheba, the place of a covenant. Um, and they're probably there. And now they're going to go north to the place of Moriah. The traditional location that we're going to discuss is right around where the Temple Mount is um, that would later be built uh, in Jerusalem. But notice the language that's given here. He says, take your son, then go. So there is the idea that you're going to go, but take your son and go. And then he says very explicitly up front, offer him as a burnt offering. Now, burnt offerings were general offerings in which they were given to God for the sake of honoring him, but it was one in which the entire offering was burnt. There was nothing left over. We see a number of places in the Old Testament where burnt offering is given. As a side note, we know that the sacrificial system is not given to the Jews or the Israelites until after Moses, but clearly sacrifice was part of the culture in that time. Burnt offering was a particular, uh, but generic, if you will, offering. Other offerings could be burnt offerings for different purposes. But this doesn't bother Abraham, it seems, because what we'll see in a moment is his response. But notice the language, offer him up as a burnt offering. And God then tells him that he will do this on one of the mountains, I will tell you. So this was reminiscent of what God did with Abraham when he called him to land to leave the land of of uh, Ur and in Haran in the north. And he says, go to a place that I will show you, to a land that I will show you. Uh, Abraham's heard this before. So he goes and he tells him, go to a land that I, or to a mountain that I will tell you. And at that mountain, you will then offer up Isaac. That's all we're told. But notice here, as we read further, uh, Abraham doesn't question this. He just obeys. And we'll see that in verses three through eight. So let's go ahead and look at that. Abraham's obedience decided. So what we have is Abraham's response. Verse three says he got up early in the morning and saddled his donkey. So he's up, he's ready to go. And then he gets other things prepared. It says in verse three that he took two of his young men. So he had some other servants with him and he went and got Isaac. That probably wouldn't have been unusual. Um, Abraham has probably taken Isaac on a number of places to uh, practice sacrifice. That's evident from what Isaac's going to say later. And then he cut the wood. It said he split the wood for the burnt offering. So he's getting everything ready. He's many, many miles away in his hometown from where he's going. So he gets everything up, gets the donkey ready. He's got the two men. They're ready to go. And then verse three concludes with, they set out and went to the place of which God had told him. Again, a very summary statement, but he's on his way. Abraham is acting. He's not questioning. He's not hesitating. Uh, he's not told anyone what's going on yet. Of course, he will in due time. But notice that he just obeys. And that's going to be one of the things that will be commended of him. He simply obeyed. And that's one of the things that the angel of the Lord is going to say about him moving forward. Well, they travel and they travel and they travel. And verse four tells us that it's on the third day that Abraham raised his eyes up and he saw the place that God was showing him from a distance. Keep that idea of raising his eyes up, because that's going to be significant in a later passage in this text. So he looks up and he sees the place, and then he speaks to the young men. Now, it's interesting, the faith that Abraham is exercising here when he says what he's about to say. 
because as we'll see later, it happens, perhaps not in the way that he expected, but it's a way in which that the later writer to the Hebrews in the New Testament will commend him. Abraham then says to the young man, you stay here with the donkey. He says, I and the boy will go over there. Of course, he'll point somewhere in the direction of the place where he's going to offer the sacrifice. He says, secondly, we will worship. And then thirdly, he says, we will return to you. And uh, in the New American Standard, it just says, and return to you. The assumption, though, is that both Abraham and his son Isaac would return. Notice Abraham already knows what he's going to do. He's going to take the boy, Isaac, with him, going to go to the mountain. They're going to worship. He doesn't say what that worship is going to entail, although it's evident there's going to be some sacrifice that takes place because everything, all of the items for sacrifice had been brought. And then he says, we will return to you, whatever that looks like. Again, key in on that note, given the fact that that's an aspect of the text that Abraham is going to be commended for in the letter to the Hebrews later. So verse six, more detail. And Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and laid it on his son Isaac. Now, he's not being crucified. He's not being sacrificed yet. Basically, Isaac's carrying the wood. So he puts the wood on Isaac and then Abraham then takes the fire and the knife and they're going to make their way. And it says at that point at the end of verse six, they walk together. Isaac hasn't said anything yet. He's just doing what God or what his father has said to do. And this is what he would have done on a number of occasions. However, he's done this enough to know there is something missing. And in verse seven, we see Isaac speak for the first time. And Isaac said to his father, Abraham, my father, Abraham responds in the same way that he had done already once with uh, with God. He'll do two more times with the angel of the Lord. His response to, to Isaac is, here I am, my son, uh, basically introducing the, the idea that, okay, go ahead and say what you need to say. I'm listening. Isaac looks at his dad and says, look, uh, the fire, um, the wood, uh, obviously there's the knife that's not mentioned, but that's brought up earlier. Uh, we have everything we need. He says, but where's the lamb for the burnt offering? Maybe he thought along the way they would hunt down the lamb, or maybe they would bring one from their own flock. Uh, it's interesting that Isaac doesn't bring this up until after they arrive at the place where they're going to make the sacrifice. At no time before that is it even brought up. That doesn't mean he um, hadn't thought it. He just hasn't brought it up yet. Well, Abraham has a response to him. In verse 8, Abraham says, God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. Now, there's a word of faith there. There's a, an, uh, an utterance of faith. God is going to provide the lamb. Now, whether he understands that to mean that God is going to stop him from offering up Isaac, or if he understands Isaac to, quote, be that lamb symbolically, what Abraham does is he, he ex exercises his faith and he voices his faith by telling Isaac, God will provide some translations may say God will provide himself um, a lamp. Probably reading too much into that to suggest with that language alone that there's a reference to Jesus. We do see ultimately there's a reference to Jesus, but the language really is that God himself will provide the lamb. And what that's going to look like, he doesn't know. He just knows that he didn't bring a lamb with him. The other thing to notice, some of your translations may point this out, uh, the New American Standard has a footnote with regard to the word provide, and that is that sometimes that word could mean see. God will see for himself the lamb for the burnt offering, and that could mean see to it that the lamb is provided, uh, maybe see that Isaac is the one who is the lamb. But, but clearly, as we look at the text later when Abraham renames the place, then we'll see that there's a connection there with provision. Well, then they continue to walk on. So the two of them walked on together uh, again. So we see that another time. They walk on and walk on. We see then Abraham's decision to obey. And even with the question of Isaac, Father, where is the lamb? Abraham doesn't even begin to question, you know, I'm thinking about sacrificing my son here. This doesn't make any sense. There's no point at which Abraham is bringing up any question about that. No doubt. He speaks the words of verse 8 to Isaac and maintains those. God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering. So we move forward. Not only has he decided his obedience, Abraham in verses 9 through 14 demonstrates his obedience. So they walk and they walk and they walk. 
they're left the donkey and the two servants behind. Then verse 9 says, then they came to the place of which God had told him. They've arrived, similar to when Abraham arrived into the land of Canaan, the land of promise that God would show him. There we see more detail about the actual process. Abraham builds the altar. He arranges the wood. And then without any other fanfare, without any other adjectives to describe the, the activity, just very nonchalantly, very matter-of-factly, we're told that he bound his son Isaac. Now, what's also not said is whether or not Isaac resisted. Perhaps he didn't. We don't know what Isaac's state of mind is at this point. Uh, he's heard his father say that God himself would provide a lamb, but now he's being bound. He doesn't say anything. Abraham binds him and then places him on the altar on top of the wood. So Isaac goes from carrying the wood to lying on top of the wood. And of course, what's going to happen next? What's going to happen next is that there will be the fire and the knife. He will be slaughtered and then set on fire as a burnt offering. Verse 10 indicates that's exactly what he's going to do. Abraham reached out with his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. Of course, it would be a ritual sacrifice. Um, not to excuse it, we do know later on that God would condemn child sacrifice. This is not in his plan either. He is testing, not tempting Abraham. But we do know later on the Israelites would be tempted by other worshipers that do practice child sacrifice. And this is certainly going to be an evidence that this is not what God wants. And so they can look back on this narrative at some point. They just fail to do that when they practice this themselves. But it's very clear that Isaac uh, or that Abraham is ready to offer up Isaac as a sacrifice. He is fulfilling what God had told him to do. Verse 11, but... We have that, but the angel of the Lord, at just the right moment, as Isaac or as Abraham is about to offer up Isaac, we see the angel of the Lord, or in this case, read about the angel of the Lord, calling from heaven and saying, and using his name twice, Abraham, Abraham. Abraham, as he has done with the with God in the in verse two, as he's done with his son Isaac later in the text, he responds again in kind, here I am. It's almost as if God called out twice, Abraham, Abraham, just to really get his attention and stop him. Abraham was going to go through with this. Verse 12, the angel said, do not reach out your hand against the boy and do not do anything to harm him. Do not do anything to him. He goes on to say something that's rather difficult to really wrap our minds around, given that uh, God is the one who is actually speaking. We'll we'll note that language here in a moment. He's called the angel of the Lord, but many places uh, we see the word angel of the Lord, the phrase angel of the Lord, and it's followed up with the reference that it was actually God. But notice the, the third person language here, the angel of the Lord is going to refer to God in the third person. But he goes on to say something that's very difficult for us to understand, given what we understand the nature of God's knowledge to be. The angel of the Lord looks and says, don't do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God. That word fear there is more of the idea of revering and worshiping God. His devotion is to God. He's willing to obey God no matter what. But the question is, what does it mean for now I know? Did I not? Did God not know that before? Uh, it is kind of covenant language of knowing. He's been able to then test Abraham and see that Abraham truly is obedient. That'll come up with what we'll say later on with regard to Paul's reference to Abraham and James's reference to Abraham. But here's what he says. I know that you fear God. And here's how. Since you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. Now, who's the me? Well, clearly that's God. The angel of the Lord is God in this case. Again, does God come to the point of knowing this? Or is it something that just happens to rec be recognition language? Abraham already knew that he would obey. This is something that becomes a visible expression of that obedience. Uh, one of the things we're going to see in Romans and Galatians and then later in James is the notion of Abraham believing God and it becoming him righteous, but then also Abraham demonstrating his faith. And so what we see here is an action following along with what is already known about Abraham. But notice how he describes Isaac. He doesn't say the son whom you love, but he does say your son, your only son. Again, the notion there is that Abraham is making the ultimate sacrifice. Verse 13, second time this happens. Abraham then raised his eyes again and looked. And this time 
the author tells us, behold, and notice uh, behind him, somewhere in the back, there was a ram caught in the thicket by its horns. What we see then is God is truly providing. Abraham takes advantage of the fact that the horn, the ram is locked in the thicket of of, of, of bushes by its horns and can't remove, can't move away. Abraham then goes and he takes the ram and he puts that on the altar and sacrifices it as a burnt offering in the place of his son. So we do see just as God, or just as Abraham had indicated to Isaac, God himself would provide a burnt offering. Now earlier there was reference to a lamb. Here it's a ram. Uh, Really, with burnt offerings, they could be different kinds of animals, so it's not going to be significant which animal. The law of Moses later on would talk about burnt offerings being different kinds of animals. So that's not the issue. The issue is that there is an animal given for a purpose, and that is to sacrifice and demonstrate devotion. The idea of burning the sacrifice is the idea that it would be completely given over to God, nothing left over for themselves. This was completely for God. There's total devotion that is given here. Isaac, or Ab I've done that a few times, Abraham has been willing to offer up his son Isaac fully to God. Notice earlier that Abraham had said that we were going to go up to the place that God showed me, we're going to go and worship, and we're going to come back. He tells Isaac God himself is going to provide a sacrifice, and all of that comes true. We'll read Hebrews chapter 11, verses 17 to 19 uh, as a summary of what the author there indicates is what Abraham's mindset was at the time. After this, then verse 14, Abraham named the place the Lord will provide, or again, the Lord will see. Uh, Jehovah Jireh, God is provider. This is a place now called the Lord will provide. The place is called Jireh. Uh, it's an interesting song as well, a new song that's been out in, well, maybe in a couple years. But the idea there is that God is the provider. He will see to it that his promise is made, that he will make good on what he has offered up. Now, for the reader of the book of Genesis, we would note, earlier readers, that there is a note about what this means for them. And it says that that name um, and that saying is continued on to this day. On the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided or it will be seen. So there's a slogan that developed as a result of this place and the significance of the place. It's the place where God provided. So we have Jaira as the place. Now we have Abraham commemorating the action here. God has provided. Now what God is going to do is respond to Abraham's act of obedience and offer up further blessing to him. So in verses 15 to 18, we have this. Abraham's obedience is blessed. Verse 15, then the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven. So notice that God is not speaking to Abraham face to face. He is in heaven. So Abraham is able to hear this, however that is taking place. But he's calling from heaven a second time. First, he tells him, don't do anything to your son. I know that you are obedient. You have demonstrated that obedience. And now he says by this word, he is going to offer up a word of blessing. Verse 16. By myself, I have sworn. When he says by myself, he doesn't mean alone, but by means of. You can swear on a Bible. He couldn't, but there was no Bible back then. But he could. you could swear on an oath. You could uh, offer up some kind of ring or some kind of, some kind of tangible item that you would swear upon to indicate that you are going to keep your promise. This is an interesting notion that the Lord makes here. And this is played out in other places. Jesus makes this point uh, in the Gospel of John in his confrontation with religious leaders about being able to make himself an oath and swearing by God. God alone can do this. By myself, I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son. And that's the third time it's been mentioned that Isaac is Abraham's only son. Here comes the blessing in verse 17. Indeed, I will greatly bless you and he says that blessing will look similar to what he had said before in his previous call to Abraham, making a blessing to him, because I will make your seed multiply greatly. Seed there, of course, is the language meaning descendants. These are the ones who will follow in generations after Abraham. Of course, right now, there's just Isaac. He says, I will greatly multiply your seed as the stars of the heavens. Now, that has been used before. That metaphor has been used before. For the first time, though, here... He adds another metaphor, extending it um, and adding even more numbers here. He says, and as the sand, which is on the seashore. And he says, and your seed shall possess the gate of their enemies. 
Now, a couple of things going on here. There is the notion of the immensity of the blessing. How many will be? There will be so many that you can't count them. They will be like the stars in the sky and the heavens and the sand on the seashore. Now, we know ultimately that doesn't happen because there are only so many people uh, that become descendants, but that language is used in fulfillment in other ways as well. It's still meaningful because the idea is countless, all right? There's two blessings here, or one blessing that has two aspects. The first, of course, is the numerical greatness. The idea there is that they will be great. There will be a large number of descendants. And again, we only have Isaac. So that's another aspect of Abraham's faith. There's only Isaac at this point. But there's another sense of that blessing. And that greatness revolves around power. The idea of their ability, what they are going to do as a result of being large or accompanying there being a large number. He says, your seed shall possess the gate of their enemies. Now, that could also mean the gate of his enemies, meaning the Lord's enemies. The idea there of possessing the gate if you listen carefully, you may catch this. When Jesus says that uh, Peter will have the keys of the kingdom and that the gates of hell will not stand against it or not withhold it. Now, I'm not going to make a one-to-one -one correspondence there. There's an echo there. But the point is that along with the great number of descendants of Abraham, the idea of possessing the gate of the enemy is the idea of taking them over and making them part of them. And what we may see here is what God had originally called Abraham to be, and that is a blessing to the nations, that all the peoples will be blessed by him, that this idea is not a military takeover, but a bringing them into the family of God. We'll talk about that in a moment as well. Verse 18 adds to this. He says, and in your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Um, some translations may say bless themselves. In other words, they would be a blessed, they would receive a blessing by way of re re relating to the descendants of Abraham. Why will this happen? It all goes back to what was said at the beginning. God said to Abraham, Abraham, and Abraham said, here I am. And then he obeyed. Verse 18 concludes with the reason for the blessing that is to come. He says, you have obeyed my voice. Well, the story goes on for one more verse before the scene changes into something else. But what we see here then is, as promised, Abraham and Isaac return to the servants, and then together they return to Beersheba. What is going on with this text? What makes this a big event? How is this passing the faith along? Well, in one way, it's the perpetuation of the faith. Okay, It's a big event because at this moment, there is a question of whether the faith is going to continue or not. I mean, think about it in practical terms. God has said through Isaac, you are going to be blessed, Abraham. Um, he is the son of the promise. But what happens if Isaac dies? That gets back to what was said earlier about Abraham believing that God would provide himself a sacrifice. And in his words to the two young men, that they would both return. We're going to see how the writer to the Hebrews picks up on this. But the point there is that he obeyed. Isaac was offered up even though he wasn't killed. Abraham was obedient to the call. He was obedient to the command to offer up his son. In Galatians 3.6 and Romans 4.3, we find, um, and also James 2.23, the phrase that Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now, we need to start there before we get to the conclusion here. We know that Abraham was a person of faith, and God already recognized his righteousness and declared him righteous and in right relationship with him by virtue of his believing. He believed God. He believed God for the promise of a son and a promise of a great nation. In Galatians and in Romans, Paul is pointing this out because Abraham now becomes a model of what it means to believe in God apart from works, and of course, apart from circumcision, because circumcision would come later in um, after the call of Abraham, the law comes many, many centuries later. James can point out in likewise, in like manner, that God uh, or that Abraham believed God and was credited with, with righteousness. But he's going to add something to that in a moment. But what are we seeing? What we're seeing then is Abraham showing his faith. He believed God. Now, what does that mean? How did he demonstrate that? We purposely identified that he decided to obey. And then he demonstrated his obedience. And that's what James 2.21 gets at. 
it says Abraham demonstrated his faith. Now, we don't have time to get into all that's going on in James 2, but James 2 talks about having a faith that works. Uh, he says faith apart from works is dead. And what he does is he gives the example of Abraham as one who believed God, was credited to him as righteousness, but he demonstrated his faith by obeying God. And of course, the word there for us is if we profess faith in Jesus, we should obey him. In a few lessons, we're going to look at the uh, at Rahab the harlot, and she's given in James chapter 2 as an example of one who demonstrated faith. So we're going to see that as a theme. What makes this a big event, of course, is that everything hinged on Abraham's obedience. Everything hinged on what God would do if Isaac was ultimately sacrificed. The pivotal point in history, then, is that the one called to be the ancestor of those who would be messengers of redemption, God's plan of redemption, uh, it was his obedience that demonstrated the kind of obedience that God desires for his people. It doesn't mean God's going to call you to sacrifice your child, literally. Uh, it may be, though, that God is going to call you to make certain sacrifices to follow after him. But in the big picture, God is working out his plan of redemption that plays out in these individual events over the course of history. And what we're seeing is God has made a plan and it will come to fulfillment. And it will require those that who are it will require those who profess faith in him to fulfill their purposes. And in turn, God will provide a fulfillment of those promises. How is that promise fulfilled? We see that God does provide a promise, uh, a fulfillment of Abraham or the promise to Abraham in this way. Not only does Abraham have physical descendants, but in the meantime, as they are to be a blessing to the Gentiles, and we know that in the Old Testament, the people of Israel were often not a blessing to the Gentiles. They often gave in to the sins of the Gentiles and became like them. But their goal, their call was to be a messenger, be the messengers of redemption to the world so that they may come in and, and Abraham would bless them by bringing them into the family. What Paul says in Galatians and in Romans is that Abraham is the father of all who believe, all who have faith, all who put their trust in him. And in Christ, then, we are adopted as sons so that the fulfillment is real. There is not just the physical descendants. And those that are physical descendants must also believe for themselves. But there are those who are adopted into the faith by virtue of their believing in Christ. And they become children of Abraham as well, Jew and Gentile alike, all the nations. And we see this mentioned over and over and over again in Galatians chapter 3. How does this then fit with the promise of Hebrews chapter 11, um, verses 17 through 19? I want to read that to you, and then we'll make a final comment because it does provide as what the author there says is a type. One, I'd like to say that there's more said about Abraham as a person of faith in the chapter Hebrews 11 than anyone else. Uh, it is called the Hall of Faith, and we're going to see a couple of places where um, in our lessons that someone is mentioned in this chapter. We see Noah, we see Abraham, uh, we'll see others as well. But what we're going to see in, in chapter 11 here are three different places where God or where the writer speaks about Abraham and his faith. We're going to look at what verses 17 through 19 say. Hebrews 11, verses 17 through 19. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac and the one who had, excuse me, and the one who had received the promise was offering up his only son. It was he to whom it was said, through Isaac, your descendants shall be named. He considered that God is able to raise people even from the dead, from which he also received him back as a type. In general, the idea of type is that even as Abraham offers up his only son, Isaac, as a sacrifice, we see later on, and by the time of the writing to the Hebrews, it's a past event as well, God offered up his only son, the one whom he loved that is mentioned in uh, the Gospels in a few places. So there's that aspect in which what Abraham did was a type. But then the writer to the, uh, to the Hebrews is also saying that Abraham took certain pieces of information and put two and two together, if you will. He knew that it was going to be through Isaac that the promise would be fulfilled. And for that to happen, Isaac would have to be alive in order to become the father of many nations. So what he does when he takes Isaac up on the mountain to sacrifice him, his only conclusion is, if God is going to give me children through Isaac, then if I give Isaac to God, he's going to have to raise him up, whatever understanding he has of that. But that's voiced in his words to the two, sons, to the two young men when he says, we will return. We're going to go up the mountain, we're going to worship, and we're going to return. What the writer of the Hebrews says is Abraham understood 
because Isaac was the son of the promise, and it would be through his descendants that the people that God would bless Abraham. Abraham determined that the way that's going to happen is I offer up Isaac. God's going to have to raise him from the dead as a type then of resurrection in some form or fashion that portends or, or will offer up a preview of Jesus' own resurrection. Just as God gave his only son, he was raised. There would be also our resurrection. What is playing out in this story in this narrative are things that will have ramifications for the rest of the redemptive history. We see then a big event in two small, in two individuals. What took place in this one event had ramifications and implications for centuries for the very plan of redemption. Now, with all of that said, we might look at what happens with Abraham and say, well, wow, yeah, but Abraham went on to be the father of the Jewish people who are God's chosen people. What, what does that mean for me? What Paul does, what James will do, is say, if you are a person who professes faith, then be obedient to what God has said. God will fulfill his promises in your life as you are obedient to him as well. Follow the example of Abraham. Don't merely say that you believe in God, but do what God has commanded you to do. You don't know what effect your obedience is going to have on others that may continue the plan of redemption, that your obedience will lead to others to come to faith. We are called to be obedient. And so what we need to do is recognize that the results of obedience for Abraham meant a history of redemption for the world. You never know what impact your obedience to God is going to have on others as well. I challenge you to continue in your profession, in your profession of faith to then also follow that in obedience with your actions. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for Abraham's example. We know that you tested him. We know that it was not a temptation to sin, for you don't do that. James 1.12 talks about taking seriously the, the testings that we face because of the character that we build in us. But we also know later in that chapter, you don't tempt anyone to sin. The test was to demonstrate to Abraham that he was faithful. I pray, Father, you will help us to face the test that we encounter and, 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 and pass them as well. Lord, I thank you for his example of obedience. We know that you asked him to do a very strange thing, something that you would condemn later uh, of a, among the people. But we know that um, in one way, this was a, a small token to indicate that it was not the way you wanted to be worshipped. But we thank you for Abraham's obedience. You're not necessarily going to call us to obey to the extent that the implications are as strong as they are in Abraham's history. But we do know that our obedience is necessary to demonstrate our faith for you and to be a witness to others, for we don't know what impact we may have on others by virtue of our obedience to you. So I just pray for the wisdom and the courage to obey you. Right now, I just ask for your continued guidance in our lives. Help us as we study your word in these big events of the Old Testament, as we look at how you've worked in these different events to bring about your plan of redemption, that we can see them fulfilled in Jesus as his work is uh, the fulfillment of all your promises. Help us then to see our place in your narrative and help us to live a life that is pleasing to you. We worship you, we honor you, and we bless you. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's take a quick moment to look at next week's lesson. We're going to be moving through Genesis again, and this time we're going to stop in and look at Genesis chapter 50. Now, the passage is short, verses 15 to 20. Uh, the title, Bloom Where You Are Planted, this is going to be a story, a narrative of Joseph. It's the final segment, if you will, the final uh, scene between Joseph and his brothers. And we'll have a very profound statement by Joseph to his brothers, considering their fear of him. I won't give too much away. I'll just challenge you to go back and read the rest of Genesis, particularly beginning in chapter 37, uh, the story of Jacob and then on to Joseph, and then see what God does so that when we read the lesson, we go through what J Joseph has to say to his brothers, we can reflect upon all that is gathered up there and then understand in context the word that Joseph speaks to his brothers regarding the purposes of God. And we'll see how then again, God works through certain big events. Well, until the next lesson, I want to share again with you Paul's prayer to the Corinthians. May the Lord Jesus Christ, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all.